Marco, we can't hear him at first for us. Good morning and welcome to the Congregational Church on Mercer Island. I am so glad to see all of you, whether you're worshiping here in person or on Zoom. Today we will be celebrating the Sacrament of Communion, so if you're worshiping on Zoom, please gather something to eat and drink for your communion elements so that you can participate with us later in the service. And if you're on Zoom, I will be putting my email address and my cell phone number in the chat and would love to hear from you. Speaking of my cell phone number, this week we had an unfortunate thing happen. Uh, many of you got a text message that was purportedly from me, which was not from me, uh, which was requesting gift cards, I believe, for people with cancer in the hospital. Um, it, it was very distressing. Uh, I tried, which we got an email out as quickly as possible, and then I individually texted everybody on the, <laughs> that I had with me when, uh, in Virginia uh, to let you know that I will never ask you for uh, gift cards or to pay anything over text or um, email. And if you ever are just wondering what's going on, please contact me before you do anything with this person. And I heard reports that this person was somewhat aggressive, would continue to engage. So I am um, distressed about it. I talked to the Mercer Island Police Department and they uh, said that these things are coming more and more through text. So did you wanna? I, I was just gonna say another, um, if you ever get a text, 
that seems like something like this, where you're like, is this or isn't it? Go into your own personal context and reach out to ask the person using a different method than simply replying to the text or replying to the suspicious email so that you're going through your own channels of communications to read it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and also, if you would put my cell phone number in your contacts, that could help because it did not come from my cell phone number. Oh. So, uh, name, it was my name, but not my cell phone number. So, um, I think we're going to need to move some chairs closer, all of you folks. We can have you join the circle. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's just a, a, a word to the wise. Unfortunately, these things are happening more and more, and um, we just need to be careful. So please reach out to me, as many of you did when this happened, and I, I really appreciate that. Our midday Wednesday gatherings uh, for Lent will begin, finally, this Wednesday, uh, March 6th, and we will start at 12.30 with lunch, and then I'll have our discussion from 1 to 2 p.m. So there is a Zoom option. If you're on Zoom, please join us at 1 o'clock. The discussion will be based on our Lenten devotional, which is Wendell Berry and the Sabbath Poetry of Lent. Those are available to you near at the table near the front door. Um, and please join us. And then this week also, our women's Bible study will start its nine-week study, uh, led by Ginny Sewell, uh, focusing on the letters of Paul. And next Sunday, our very own Lily Podvodsky will be preaching. So please come uh, for that. There are many ways that we can give. Uh, we, you can give to the church on our website, ucc-ccmi.org. You can click on the QR code in your bulletin, or there is a plate in the back of the sanctuary for you to give if you're here in person. Stan Harrison on Zoom asked me to tell you all that he is in need of volunteers for next Sunday's shared breakfast. He will be sending an email this afternoon, but if you are not on his email distribution list and you're interested in this opportunity of helping to uh, provide breakfast for a hundred, about a hundred, is that right? About a hundred people who are living on the streets of Seattle. Uh, you can let me know and I'll get you in contact with him. And now, let us welcome one another with the peace of God. If you're worshiping on Zoom, please extend greetings of peace in the chat. And if you're worshiping in person, please stand and greet one another with the peace of God. So this is what happens when I don't end the announcements with, are there any other announcements? Because it turns out there are. Uh, first of all, next week, the clocks change. We spring forward. A collective ug about that. but. Well, we'll skip an hour of sleep, but uh, I expect y'all to be here, bright-eyed, push your tail. <laughs> and Dale has an announcement. So, uh, next Saturday, the eastbound lanes of I-90 are closed from South Rainier Avenue the whole way to East Mercer Way. So, say, if you're coming to the women's breakfast next Saturday from Seattle, you cannot use I-90 supposed to be westbound lanes are all open okay so um and it's supposed to reopen sunday at six so should, we should be fine for sunday but saturday is a problem if you're coming from the C seattle to the church for any reason and if of course anyway. yeah come anyway take 520 and go around um and you can also go into Seattle next Saturday on an errand, but you can't come back <laughs> unless you go 520. What is that? I have uh, the uh, details here. I'll put them back there if you're interested. There'll be some driving around on Saturday, but they'll be open for Sunday. So let's continue our worship now with our gathering words. We've come to worship God who makes streams flow from rock, 
who turns the parched earth into springs of water, who sends the rain from heaven and makes the wilderness blossom and flourish. As the deer thirsts for flowing streams, so we thirst for you, O God. Come, let's worship our life-giving God who pours out living water on all who thirst. Will you please stand and join in our opening hymn, number 53, Morning Has Broken. comes from Mary Oliver, and it is a poem titled Mornings at Blackwater. For years, every morning I drank from Blackwater Pond. It was flavored with oak leaves and also, no doubt, the feet of ducks. And always it assuaged me from the dry bowl of the very far past. What I want to say is that the past is the past, and the present is what your life is, and you are capable of choosing what that will be, darling citizen. So come to the pond, or the river of your imagination, or the harbor of your longing, and put your lips to the world and live your life. Our scripture reading today comes from John chapter four and it will be in the form of a video. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me some water to drink. The woman said, how can you, a Jew, Ask me, a Samaritan, for water. Jesus replied, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give will never be thirsty again. The Book of John, Chapter 4. They say your life could change in an instant. And mine did when a Jewish man asked me, a Samaritan, for a drink. I have been drinking from the same well for more years than I could count. For me, change seemed impossible. I didn't even want it. But the well always left me thirsty. So I came back to it. 
over and over, and no one else could see me. I always came alone. The truth was, I had no husband. He told the truth, the real part of my life, the one I tried to hide, but he looked right through me and met me where I was. He wasn't ashamed of me. He wasn't angry. In my life, I thought I'd experienced love. I, I thought I was pretty good at finding it too. But I didn't even know what love was. On an ordinary day, I went to draw water and had a thirst quenched I didn't even know I had. I don't know if they'll believe me, but I gotta try. I gotta tell them I found the Messiah. Rather, he found me. Will you please pray with me? Holy and loving God, help me to honor you in the words I am about to speak. And help us to feel your presence as we explore what it means to experience living water. So how did you like that video? Get to mix it up a bit once in a while. And here's a fun Bible fact about this story. This conversation that makes up the, account, the encounter between Jesus and the woman at the well. It is the longest conversation Jesus has with anyone in the Gospels. And with a woman, no less. We might expect that his longest conversation in the Bible would be with a disciple or with a religious leader, but it instead it is with a foreign, marginalized woman, which tells us a lot already about the Savior that we follow, right? Like many stories of women in the Bible, she is unnamed. But the power of this story continues to inspire. Now, much has been made of this woman and her checkered past. I think many of us perhaps have heard variations of the same sermon about her. A sermon from well-known conservative minister John Piper is typical of how she has been portrayed by so many. He describes her as a worldly, sensually minded, unspiritual harlot from Samaria. Does that tone sound familiar to you? Another sermon referring to this scripture that I found this week was entitled, She Finally Found a Good Man, <laughs> which I personally found very annoying as well as inaccurate because it is Jesus who spoke to her first. It is Jesus who found her and not the other way around. As preaching professor Fred Craddock writes, evangelists aplenty have assumed that the brighter her nails, the darker her mascara, and the shorter her skirt, the greater the testimony to the power of the converting word. Ugh. The misogyny runs deep. For the truth is, we don't know what happened in her past. We don't know why she'd been married so often. 
Perhaps she was a child bride who was widowed and passed along through a line of her elderly husband's elderly brothers, as was the law. Perhaps she was infertile and was left by a string of men for that reason. But I have to say that it is the least likely possibility that she was a seductress who lured man after man into her trap. We just don't know. We don't know if her wounds were self-inflicted or inflicted by others or some combination of the two. But we do know that she carried wounds, as we all do. And maybe those wounds made her want to avoid the eyes or judgments of other women as she avoided the mornings at the well where women traditionally went to fetch water, when women traditionally went. And instead, she chose to go to the well in the heat of the day when she was likely to be alone and to be left alone. But her plan of staying unseen and under the radar was not working out this particular day, as Jesus was there at the well and began to talk to her. And we, I can't emphasize enough how many social taboos he crossed to do this. Speaking to a woman? Not allowed. And not just a woman, but an ethnic outsider? A Samaritan? For we should remember that Samaritans and Jews did not have much use for one another. And not only was she a woman and also an ethnic outsider, but also a woman who had been married five times and was now with someone who was not her husband. This conversation was so out of the ordinary and crossed so many boundaries, according to the social mores of the time. Jesus had no business striking up a conversation with her. But there he is. And it is the two of them. And he asks her for a cup of water. And it strikes me that Jesus often speaks with words and phrases we can understand and relate to in more than one way. He doesn't use fancy pants theological language like theological grounding or hermeneutical options or ecclesiological implications, words that religious leaders sometimes use to show how smart they are, which has the effect of creating distance between themselves and those they lead. Instead, Jesus illustrates what he means by using the basic elemental things in life. Water and bread, and harvest, salt, and light, the gifts of the natural world. And this encounter, this gift of living water, changes everything. A woman with no name and a hurtful past discovers that someone has found her, seen her, and loved her. All of the secrets that this woman thought she had to hide are laid bare in that bright noonday sun. The well at noon on a hot day in Samaria becomes, for a short time, a place of grace and divine encounter, where this woman's deepest spiritual and emotional thirsts are quenched in Jesus. I recently read a description of faith that I absolutely love from Catholic theologian James Allison. He describes faith not as intellectually agreeing to a set of theological propositions, but instead he describes faith as relaxing. Relaxing in the love and presence of God in the way that we relax in the presence of someone we are certain cares about us. For when we're in the presence of someone that we know cares about us, we are funnier, more spontaneous. We are softer and less defended. We are more ourselves 
and there's no reason to pretend anything. Allison says, faith is this process of relaxing. And perhaps this is what happens to the woman at the well. Perhaps the living water, the spiritual sustenance that Jesus provides, finds a crack in her defenses, finds her greatest need, and enables her to finally exhale. And like her, we come before God, who knows our every thought and our every hope, our every gift in our every broken place, who knows every single beautiful thing about us, every wonderful story, and also the ones that aren't so great. We come before God, and God offers us a cool drink of water, a place to rest, a place to relax, a place where we are listened to and loved. I had an experience when I was in Virginia this week that felt like living water for me. My stepfather, Daryl, was having a particularly hard day in the hospital. He and my mom are members of the local Episcopal church, and the two priests at their church were alternating days of visiting us in the hospital, offering comfort and prayer. And that day, their associate rector, Kathleen, came to visit and prayed into the discouragement of the day, pleading with God that we would feel the peace of God that passes all understanding, no matter the circumstances. And in that moment, I felt it. I felt the spiritual sustenance of living water washing over me, reminding me that the love of God and my connection with God is not dependent on how things are going, but is ever-present. And so I had this experience of sinking into my faith, of relaxing, of letting go. And I know this story doesn't sound earth-shattering, but it was immensely comforting in the middle of a difficult day. I am so grateful for it. And you may remember that a few years ago it became popular to ask, what would Jesus do? Here in this story, we have a clear example and it's a powerful one. Jesus goes to where the outsiders are and waits patiently for their arrival. He engages in authentic encounter with those who are outside of his own social and religious group and shows no sign of disgust or discomfort or judgment at the secrets they divulge. Jesus makes no assumptions about this woman's past her choices, or her personal morality. Instead, he encourages her to acknowledge the truth about herself and to see for herself who she really is, not by accusing her or damning her, but by practicing the art of compassionate listening. He withholds all unnecessary judgment about her past or her pain or her history, he goes out to meet her where she is. He encounters her with her authenticity and honesty. He respects and listens to her. And he offers her living water with no strings attached. And my friends, that is a model for ministry. How might we more fully encounter those we meet in this radical life-giving way? And what would it mean for us to more fully embrace this way of being as a church community? We have come here this morning, I think, hoping for just such an encounter, an authentic meeting with one another and with Jesus. The Jesus who has seen into the depths of our souls and who knows the deepest thirsts of our hearts. So if your heart feels like a dry well this morning, Rejoice in the good news that there is living water for you, 
abundant living water. We have come here this morning because we too want to be in a holy space, full of memories and sacred traditions, a place where those who have gone before us are still with us. So this morning, this place is the well where we encounter one another as Jesus encountered a Samaritan woman. Spiritually thirsty, but with ears open, listening to one another, encountering one another, and encountering God. And we have come because we still believe in that promise of living water that satisfies thirsty souls and where we can experience sweet rivers of mercy. May it be so. Amen. Thank you. 
Thank you, that was really beautiful. So we come now to our time of prayer. And how this will work today is I will invite you to come forward and use the microphone to offer your prayer. And end your prayer request, please, by saying, this is my prayer. And we will all respond, this is our prayer. And then you will pour some water into the beautiful vase there. If you have prayers that you would like to offer, but you would, don't want to offer them verbally, you'd like to offer them silently, I invite you to still come up and pour some water into the vase. As our prayers are poured out, notice that they are joined together, that we are never alone, but that our prayers are held together in community. So let the promise of living water infuse your soul as we pray together now. Each time we come together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we participate in an incredible mystery. The John passage from this week continues on to tell us that Jesus and his disciples stayed for two days with the people of Samaria. Imagine the meals they had together. Imagine the conversation. Imagine the images they had created in their own hearts of the other, and how being in the very presence of Jesus, the images were likely deconstructed. When we participate in this meal, we do it with the whole multitude of Christ's church. Despite our differences, our sins, our histories, and our brokenness, Jesus invites us into communion with him and with one another. Barriers are broken down, his life and light are made available to us, and for this unique moment, we are all unified by God's grace. What a gift. Jesus was both the receiver and giver of hospitality. He ate and drank with all people, offering himself to them, leading them to living water. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks for it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat it, remember me. Likewise, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to the disciples, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Bread for your journey, the cup of blessing. These are the gifts of God poured out for you. Whether you're here in this building or in your home, the Spirit is with you. As you take the elements, know that you are beloved by God. I invite you to come forward now to receive the sacrament of communion, for all things are ready. There is a gluten-free option for those who require it. All are welcome.
Let us pray. Good and merciful God, we pray that our theology would be more than words as it is made real in our lives. May this meal nourish our bodies and souls so that we might live in service to the world around us, to your glory. Amen. And will you please now stand for our closing hymn number 247, Wind Upon the Waters. We'll be singing verses 1, 3, and 5. Come all who are thirsty, says Jesus. Come all who are weak, taste the living water that I shall give. Dip your hands in the stream, refresh body and soul. Drink from it, depend on it, for this water will never run dry. In light of this good news, go now from this service of worship to the service of God's people, near and far. Refreshed by the living water that Jesus offers to you, listen for the parched voices of the least of these. Search out the dry places and the arid souls and become for them a spring of living water. And as you go, may the blessings of the God of life the Christ of love and the spirit of grace be upon you this day and forevermore. Amen. Wave to our Zoom friends. <laughs>